1993. Delegate Kilgore represents Scott and Lee counties, part of Weiss County and the city of Norton. He serves as chairman of the House Commerce and Labor Committee and is a member of the House Courts of Justice Committee and the House Rules Committee. I introduce to you a warm welcome for Delegate Terry Kilgore. Yeah, it's on. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, it's great to be here with you. Great to be here with Evan uh, Bauman. He uh, has worked uh, with us on the Tobacco Commission for years, but now he's got a new job uh, that uh, we've uh, linked him over to the governor's office uh, as our uh, broadband director, and he's doing a great job on that. You know, with the uh, also, uh, I serve on the Tobacco Commission, and uh, we started years ago investing in broadband, and what we invested in was that middle mile. Uh, trying to and and, and and to some degree the last mile we have uh, to uh, some degrees but uh, you know it gets more costly as you get out into the rural areas uh, because that last mile is what's really going to cost uh, uh, each of each of the counties each of the localities out there or the providers that uh, want to step up and what we found is a lot of the providers do not want to step up because they're not enough people. You know, like if you go down into some of my area, you know, you got a, a house every half a mile, you know, that, that's not a good return on investment uh, for uh, private companies to put that investment in. But uh, we have uh, made some uh, moves uh, in the General Assembly, made, uh, made some moves to uh, put more money in the broadband, but also one thing that we did uh, last year, uh, we passed the Grid Modernization Act. Now, what does uh, broadband have to do with power? Uh, uh, well, each of these uh, power companies, when you look at AEP, Dominion, they all have fiber that run uh, to their substations. And they, a lot of that fiber is unused because it doesn't take a lot of fiber to run a substation. So we uh, have been working with uh, AEP, Dominion to uh, try to get them, uh, or try to uh, get those, the use of some of that fiber to provide uh, that middle mile to so that we can uh, more uh, economically get to the last mile. Uh, we're working on a pilot project now in Grayson County with uh, AEP and that uh, pilot project seems to be going real well and looks like that uh, it's going to uh, benefit not only the citizens of Grayson County but it's also going to benefit us in moving forward in uh, working with our uh, incumbent uh, utility providers to uh, use uh, those uh, fibers that go to the uh, uh, go to their substations, but you know there are still a lot of challenges uh, with rural areas. You got a lot of uh, you know with the happy you know the population the density is not there. Also, when you get out in Southwest Virginia, it's mountainous. Uh, uh, the rock, uh, hey, you know, uh, getting all the uh, rural if you want to put it uh, on the lines, uh, what's the cost of putting it on the uh, power company? Uh, uh, power poles or the uh, util other utility power poles and uh, other other uh, op other issues we've had is actually uh, uh, how do you get across railroad lines? Uh, you know that's been expensive. How do you uh, pour under a line? What, what permits do you have to have? And you know when when a railroad's trying to charge you uh, a lot of money just to get to the other side of the track and try to get across the track, and there's only three or four houses. Uh, across uh, on the other side, it's you know a lot of times you have to walk away uh, from that because the cost uh, is uh, is not there. But uh, you know we got we got some challenges, but we got to look. You know I know that we have to look at wireless, the wireless opportunities in our rural areas. The wireless has changed. I mean, who would have thought uh, 25 years ago that you'd have you know one of these iPhones in your pocket that has everything uh, that you need in life on it? You know you can answer any question. If you're, on a if you're on a network, but you got to get on a network exactly. But uh, it, you know, wireless has some. Uh, uh, you know, we could use wireless in certain areas. You can't use wireless when you have to look for businesses and things of that nature, where you have to be more secure. But you could use wireless to uh, if you get wireless. Uh, uh, you know, if you get the wireless, where it would be better, where you can stream Netflix and Amazon Prime and all that stuff. But uh, you know, we, we've got some challenges right now because uh, you know, in uh, the more uh, densely populated areas, you know, you're 
Fairfax or Loudoun and places like that. They are now moving uh, to 5G to 6Gs and uh, you know putting all these wireless uh, towers everywhere because people when they you know at five five o'clock at night when they're there at home they want to be able to get click on and and get on and that that's a big that's just going to be a continuing continuing bigger issue uh, for the general assembly uh, to uh, look at and how we uh, fund uh, opportunities. But Evan, I'm going to turn it over to Evan. Uh, he's going to bring you up to date on what uh, uh, the governor's office is is doing. And Evan does a great job. He's done a great job with the back of the commission. And uh, he did such a great job. We knew that he could handle the, uh, other, another job <laughs> just thrown on top of it. So Evan, thank, thank God. I appreciate it, Terry. Uh, so, uh, afternoon, everybody. Morning, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's a, a privilege to be able to speak to y'all. Um, you know, I, I, this is, uh, Doug Kilgore, Kilgore will be upset to hear this, but I know there may be a few folks in the room who are unfamiliar with the Tobacco Commission. So why don't we we're really quickly run through with that. Is so I, I, I joined the commission a, a few years back. We don't sell cigarettes. Uh, you can find them somewhere around here, actually. But uh, uh, instead, uh, the, the commission is funded out of the settlement that the various states attorneys general made with the tobacco companies in the late 90s. And its mission is to do economic development across southern and southwest Virginia. So a set of counties uh, in Southside and Southwest have access to our support. And uh, in that role, one of the things that, that, that uh, as you heard, one of the things that we figured out is it's very difficult to grow an economy without access to broadband. So the commission began investing pretty seriously uh, more than a decade ago in broadband connectivity and has spent now uh, nearly 140, uh, somewhere between 140 and 150 million dollars on broadband connectivity across southern and southwest Virginia. And as a big, uh, as a result of that, uh, the that as rural Virginia goes, those regions are, are, are ahead of the rest of the Commonwealth. And that's an advantage that that area has. Uh, but so. You know, I've been going around kind of pounding some podiums and saying, look, you know, we need to get serious about this, we need to get serious about this. And Governor Northam said, well, you know, Evan, you seem pretty heated up about it, why don't you go do it? Uh, and I said, well, I don't want to leave the commission. He said, no, 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 you can have a second job, that's fine. Uh, uh, I don't know that I can recommend uh, two jobs to everybody, but I know for a fact I can't recommend saying no to governors. So uh, we moved forward, and, and I, I'm, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to do both. Uh, the governor, last summer, set me and, and Courtney Dozier, who's the chief deputy over the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, the goal of getting universal broadband coverage in no more than 10 years. Uh, and I want to emphasize that no more than in that sentence, because while that is an ambitious goal, and I firmly believe we'll be the first large state to pull it off, uh, the governor is also very clear that um, if on year nine, day 364, we light up that last house, that's a D minus for me and my team. In fact, we need to go significantly faster. So we're working on that, and I'm, I'm pleased to report we're on track. Uh, but to back up a little bit, I know everybody in this room uh, is all the way up to speed and cares deeply about broadband, but you may wind up talking to some folks who don't. And so when we approached the problem, we really felt like there were two questions that we needed to answer first. Number one is, should we do this? And there's three real reasons we ought to do it. The first is, um, and this will be no stranger, particularly to the elected folks in this room. This is a social and a political demand. Uh, folks want access to the internet. They want access to Netflix and Amazon Prime. They want access to social media. And I don't think just because those are entertainment uh, venues that we should trivialize it. If that's where our social conversation is, if that's where we're having our, our political dialogue, if that's how we're talking to our friends and neighbors, keep it up with our classmates and our family members, and that is important, and it doesn't just mean, hey, you're streaming Netflix. That's something that, that folks are right to want to have access to because they correctly understand that it's something that most of their fellow citizens have access to. So it's a political demand. It's an economic necessity. When I talk to business leaders uh, in my role with the commission uh, to see if, they're one, if they want to come to our footprint, if I offer them a beautiful site with a wonderful workforce in an area that doesn't have broadband internet, the conversation's open they flat out will not expand their business into a place where not just at the place of business, but in the residences around the place of business, they can't get access to the internet. And that makes intuitive sense. You want to be able to get on the phone with your plant manager and say, hey, I just emailed you 
X, Y, or Z, we gotta get this thing up and running tomorrow. We need that person to not have to say, well, hold on, let me get my car and drive to McDonald's so I can take a look at that email. That doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so the, the fact of the matter is business is 24 seven today. If you don't have access to the internet, both at home and at work, you're not gonna be able to grow your economy. The last component of why we should do it though is a moral component. Um, when you look at the folks at the very beginning and the very end of the life, of the, the, the span of life, uh, children and the elderly, uh, those are the folks who actually stand to benefit the most from this. Uh, the opportunity for folks uh, later in life to age in place and to do that safely and with access to good medical care in large part depends on access to the internet. There are incredible medical devices now. Things as simple as uh, a monitor on your refrigerator that checks to make sure the door's been open in the last uh, a few hours. I don't know about y'all, I go to the refrigerator a lot, a lot more than I should. Uh, if, if for many hours that door doesn't open, well that's a nice signal that something's wrong. But there's also, there's automated glucose monitors, automated blood pressure checkers, all sorts of stuff. And that can help our elderly Virginians stay in their homes, which is what they want. And by the way, save us all a boatload of money because we don't need to be, as their family or as their, their, their fellow citizens, be picking up the tab for them to be in long-term care. On the front end of the life spectrum, when you talk about kids, uh, what we know for a fact is that children who are, grow up in a household without a good broadband connection don't do as well after high school as those who do. And that's after you correct for the affluence of the parents, after you correct for the quality of the education system. I'll tell you, and I don't know if any of y'all know Jack Kennedy, but he's, he's been shouting this from the rooftops for years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Four of the top 10 school districts, K through 12 school districts in the Commonwealth are in far southwest Virginia. I think that surprises a lot of people. But the fact of the matter is, we are still not seeing the post-secondary outcomes for those kids that we want, and in part, it's because they don't have access to a good broadband connection. And so, the question of should we do it becomes pretty clearly a resounding yes. For all these various reasons, for social and political reasons, for economic reasons, and for moral reasons, the right thing to do is to get universal broadband coverage. So the next question is, can we do it? Well, we spent probably the first six or seven months of the Norfolk administration scoping that problem out, trying to figure out if this was a solvable problem. And when we really looked at the numbers, with an assumption that the federal government will at least maintain its current level of effort, which is a safe assumption, and it looks like they're going to increase it, with an assumption that local government is ready, willing, and interested in partnering with us to do it, I think that's a pretty darn safe bet. Uh, and with the assumption that the private sector will kick in some resources at least to the point where they can be marginally profitable or breaking even on these projects, and that's proven true, then it looks like our scope cost is gonna be something like 250 to 300 million state dollars, which is a lot of money on the one hand. On the other hand, and please don't take away from this, particularly folks from, uh, well, if you're folks from Hampton Roads at Baco, but uh, you know, it's less than a fifth of what we're gonna spend on the new Two for the HRBT, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. Now, I don't, they need that tunnel badly. Anybody who's ever been caught in traffic over there? Absolutely. But the, the point is, it is within our means, particularly over the course of a decade, to put together that amount of money. When we go to the General Assembly and we work on it, um, what we found is that the General Assembly shares the governor's view that this needs to get there. But we've still got some education work about how we're getting it. And so I'm going to share with y'all what we're doing. And then I'm going to ask you to share how persuasive I was with your members of the House of Delegates and the Senate. And so we'll get to that in a sec. So there's really three big things that we're doing. The first and the most important one is, is, is what Delegate Kilgore talked about. It's solving that math problem. The thing is, uh, a mile of internet infrastructure in Fairfax and a mile of internet infrastructure in Flavana costs the same amount of money to build. There's a whole lot more folks you can get revenue from in Fairfax than in Havana. So what we've got to figure out how to do with this, how do we make that math work for whomever is building that network, whether it's uh, Central Virginia Electric Co-op, whether it's Comcast, whether it's a wireless provider. Uh, the important thing is that nobody is going to do something that, in which they're going to lose money. So the solution that we've come up with, and this is the, the primary vehicle for broadband internet deployment, is we're making one-time <coughs> capital grants to public-private partnerships. So these internet service providers need to come to y'all, either a, a county or a group of counties or a PDC, get y'all to agree to join them in this partnership, and then they become eligible to receive a grant. The reason that makes a lot of sense is we don't have to reinvent the wheel in the public sector. We don't need to create a network engineering department, a marketing department, a customer service department. 
Uh, moreover, we've hedged against our risk. We don't have to deal with the maintenance, we don't have to deal with the winter storms, we don't have to deal with the angry phone calls when the, when the service goes out. All of that risk exists on the private sector side. We make a one-time capital commitment, that infrastructure gets built out, and then they operate. And um, we uh, are doing that primarily through grants, both through the Tobacco Commission and then through the, the Department of Housing and Community Development's body program, the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative. Governor Northam's most recent budget requested $50 million for the body program. Uh, the General Assembly was uh, somewhat skeptical of our ability to ramp that program up. I, that's fair. I, I didn't happen to share that view, but that was fair. Uh, and they plus us up to $19 million. We accepted applications for those $19 million. We got $43 million in requests for that $19 million in, uh, uh, in funding. So I'll tell you, it isn't enough. Uh, and we're going to be announcing those awards here in December. And the governor will do that. He'll do that on his time frame, so I can't give you a more specific date. Uh, it's going to be driven in part by the communication cycle, and you all understand how that works. Uh, the, the second big thing we're doing, so we're making grants. That's, one, that's item number one. The second big thing we're doing uh, is we're working on, on policy. And so there's, there's two big categories of policy where we're making efforts. One is inside the executive branch. There's a lot of work to do there. Two big areas we're working are with VDOT to upgrade their standards and make it easier and cheaper to deal with them. And the second is with the Department of General Services. Uh, they handle all the real estate for all the, the Commonwealth's assets. And one of the things that we realized is it's easy when you deal with state government a lot to, to sort of start seeing right past the alphabet soup that you live in. But for a general citizen or even a, a fairly sophisticated telecommunications company, <coughs> figuring out if a piece of state owned land belonged to DCR or DGIF or VMRC or DOC, all of that's complicated. They all have different rules. And then you've got to figure out how do I get to the person who can explain to me what the rules are for this parcel. We're solving all of that. We're creating a single port of point of contact whereby people who want to do telecommunications work can access Commonwealth real estate. And I actually hope that expands out to be anytime anybody wants to deal with Commonwealth real estate, there will be a single point of contact uh, that will streamline that effort. And that'll actually be better for state government and it will be better for folks who need to deal with state maintenance. So that's going really well. Uh, the second area where we deal with public policy very frequently is with the General Assembly. Uh, we worked on two bills. One was the, uh, the, the grid modernization bill that, that Delegate Kibler talked about. And that really is a great opportunity. Dominion did a study that actually showed that they believe they can make significant numbers of new connections while actually saving the ratepayer $75 million uh, over the course of the study. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. At the end of the day, they already have to string a bunch of new fiber to upgrade their grid. And while it's a little more complicated than this, the difference in marginal cost between pulling a cable this thick and pulling a cable this thick is pretty slight. And so by getting them to do the thicker cable and creating a regulatory environment where they can do that, we can leverage that opportunity to extend service to a bunch of folks. And uh, as you heard, Appalachian Power has gone first. They've got a great project in with, uh, with Grayson County. Grayson County is going to wind up having universal broadband coverage here if that project moves through the State Corporation Commission and then there's a, a body grant that would be associated with it. Um, I can't tell you what's going to happen there, but uh, keep your eyes peeled. Um, one thing related to that, the State Corporation Commission has to approve each one of these pilot projects. They have an oversight role in the regulated electric utility space. They accept public comment, and that public comment period is open right now. They very rarely hear from folks. If they heard from a bunch of county leaders around the Commonwealth who were not in Grayson, that, hey, we think what's going on in Grayson is great, we think this partnership with Appalachian Power is great, and we look forward to taking advantage of this program in our localities, that will start to move them. And so I'll give you the opportunity to, to follow up that, on that link. Uh, we have our website, commonwealthconnect.virginia.gov. There's a link to that public comment on that site. Uh, we also, through our, our, you can sign up for our mailing list, and we'll send out updates that'll help folks with some sample text and things that people can use to make comments. So please do weigh in uh, with them on that question. Uh, the second big area of uh, policy that I think would be interesting in this room is uh, Delegate Thomas created a new special tax district. Um, uh, that allows local governments by ordinance to create a new fee that can only be used for broadband infrastructure. Um, what we've seen, in, and I know that makes folks nervous, uh, and the old joke is, well, you know, how do you spell tax in Virginia? F-E-E. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the thing is, though, when you look at surveys of rural Virginians, uh, over 80% would be willing to spend, to pay a small fee, if they thought that it would get their community connected. And I think it really speaks to the character of rural Virginians that I think we all already knew, but it's nice to see in black and white. 
is that even folks who already have it at home, more than 80% of them, a few fewer, but more than 80% of them still, would be willing to pay that fee to see the rest of their community connect because they understand how important it is that everybody have access to this critically needed uh, uh, infrastructure. So I encourage folks to, to pursue that where you have a big fiscal gap to bridge. But the third place that I think you want to start before you start jumping into stuff is we're working to, to upskill local and regional governments to support your planning around uh, universal coverage. And so uh, we rolled out our local leaders toolkit over the summer. Uh, you can also download, download that at our website. I encourage you to do it. It has a step-by-step -step plan uh, that will take you from, hey, what the heck's broadband to, hooray, we've all got broadband. Uh, we can do that teleconference from home. Uh, the, my team is ready, willing, and able to support local planning efforts. We've pulled in an interagency task force, the folks from CIT, the folks from DHCD, the folks from VDOT, and the folks from the Tobacco Commission are all working together to support local governments in putting together the kind of plans you need. And if we get to a point where you need some additional resources, you've now got different pathways to get funds to do planning, whether it's a Go Virginia grant, whether it's a Community Development Block grant, uh, whether it's a, a number of different other pathways that we can, we can point you down to support you in that. But the first thing you need to do before you go hire a high dollar consultant, before you, you, you begin to, to do a bunch of other stuff, is get in contact with us, tell us where you are, and let us give you some free advice about where you can take your next couple of steps before you start spending money. It, it really, I, I, when you look at our step-by-step -step guide, every fourth or fifth step is, hey, check in with the state broadband team. We don't know as well as y'all what's going on in your communities. It would be absurd for us to try. We need to work in partnership to make sure that those plans come together in a strong fashion. And then once we've got a good plan to get everybody online, then we start filling that, that resource gap. And so that's the third big area where we're working. The decision points that are coming up are significant. One, we're going to be working with the federal government here. Uh, I am thrilled with the amount of money the feds are spending in Virginia. The FCC has committed around $84.5 million so far to broadband expansion. And that $84.5 million is going to get around 33,000 homes and businesses connected sometime in the next decade. So please take away. I said, I am thrilled the FCC is doing that. It's also worth noting that our team has spent around $25 million to connect 71,000 homes and businesses. And that'll be done in the next year and a half to two years. So we're about six times more efficient three times faster than the federal government. And so while we're grateful for their efforts, we're also working with our congressional delegation to see if we can get them to block rate those funds down to the state. We're closer to the ground, and the same way you all know better what's going on in your communities, we know better than the feds what's going on in Virginia. And we can tailor our program to be more efficient and more effective. Uh, and so we, we will be pushing out messages of support uh, from uh, or through VACO to folks. We're gonna ask you all to weigh in I'm very pleased to report that both senators and every member of Congress from Virginia supports our block grant proposal. Uh, Congressman Whitman has taken the lead in putting together a delegation letter. The governor will have a letter. And then we're going to be working for our coalition to try to build out as much public support as we can for that effort. The second big decision point that's coming up is the next General Assembly session. Governor Northam is going to introduce a very large budget for project. If you want to steal your boss's thunder, I'm not going to tell you anything about what that number is or what he's going to announce it, but it's going to be a large number and it's going to be important. We need y'all to contact your delegate and senator and ask them to fully fund the governor's broadband. When I said earlier we needed a couple hundred million dollars, this is infrastructure. There isn't any other way to build infrastructure but to pay for it. And the only way we can make the math work for these private providers, whether they're nonprofit or whether they're for profit, is so that they can't be losing money doing it. We have to fill that gap. That costs public dollars. The value, the return on investment will be tremendous. This is a positive ROI the whole time, but we need y'all's help. So please contact your delegate center. I got a guy sitting right here who will tell you, if he gets 25 calls in his office on something, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Uh, or emails. Yes. Y'all can move <laughs> your, your member of the house and your state center. So please do contact them. I'm very happy to talk to you about how we can do that best. But I also find that in these sorts of situations, um, questions and answers are often the most uh, illuminating thing for folks. So I figured we're well, going to hear a little bit about a case study, and then let's, uh, let's have a conversation. Give me one minute to get the technology going. <laughs> the host says Wi-Fi is pretty good, except downstairs, <laughs> where it gets a little job.
So good afternoon once again. Again, Jeff Stokes, Deputy County Administrator, Prince George County. You know, I want to I want to thank Delegate Kilgore and Evan Feynman for being here today. We've actually connected into the middle mile fiber that was built by the Tobacco Commission. So the only reason our project was successful is there was a backhaul there to get into. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'd also like to thank our Board of Supervisors of Prince George County, uh, Mr. Ashcraft, our County Administrator, the IDA, and Prince George Electric Co-op, who were all partners of the process and came to the table. First of all, where is Prince George County? We're the Red County, about 40 minutes south of Richmond. And in case you're wondering about how rural we are, uh, this project is currently averaging nine homes per mile. <laughs> It is a public-private partnership that is very unique. Uh, Evan described himself as heated. Uh, well, actually, others described Evan as heated. Um, I could come across pretty low. Well. Um, <laughs> I'm going to come across as bitter. Um, I've been at this for 17 years in both rural New York and rural Virginia. I've been told no for 17 years. We finally found a solution that works in our community, and Comcast was in our IDA meeting trying to stop us which means I'm doing something right. right. <laughs> Good artists borrow, great artists steal. This is not a new idea. 2010, Como, Connect Missouri. There's an electric co-op out there and they started stringing fiber. They figured out a way to do it. Our solution is a little twist on what they did. Every state is different. Uh, state Corporation Commission, in other states, sometimes the co-ops will allow you to run both fiber and electric under the same umbrella. In Virginia, they do not. They actually make you create a separate entity to run the fiber. That's, uh, and we'll get into that a little later about how that's a, a blessing and a curse. Uh, this is the gold standard. Fiber to the home is what you want, period. I'm not going to go over the need for broadband. If you're in this room, you know you need broadband. Um, people are just tired of HughesNet not working in the rain on a Friday night when you want to stream a video or paying $220 a month for a Verizon MiFi that may or may not work. Lack of broadband was the number one complaint for Prince George County before we started this project. How many of you, when you bought your last home, said to the realtor, show me the homes without electricity? <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? 80 years ago, you could do that. You could go to Newville, Virginia. You could buy a home without electricity. What happened? Well, the Rural Electrification Act happened, 1936, about $7.4 billion in today's money. FDR, Congress appropriated and started rolling it out. History is now repeating itself once again. Our example is an example when our rural community was told no by everybody. We were told no by the telecommunication providers. We put out a wireless ISP RFP, got zero responses. We did not qualify for any state or federal programs. Uh, we were sitting there dead in the water trying to figure out what to do. So, is it doable? Yes, it is. And let's get back to that SEC. Because it's a separate entity, it's interesting. Prince George Electric Co-op created this separate fiber entity. Well, that's great, but it has no money. Along comes the county. We have to capitalize this new entity. And we did it through a taxable bond for a million dollars. And we gave it to them. We created an agreement, and we said, go off, off to the races, here we go. The other interesting thing about this, because it's a separate entity, it has to be treated like any other telecommunication provider. So if you have poles out in the middle of nowhere that don't have Comcast on them, this new entity, this new fiber entity, they can actually pay the pole fee and go on those poles. And I'll give you the example. We're not just on Prince George Electric Co-op poles. We've paid the pole fee to Dominion, and we've strung fiber down Route 10 to Burrowsville and hooked up our library and community center out there. The key to our project is very simple. You have a pilot, you have like 50 homes. You go slow. 
You're not, don't go to your community and say, well, for 60 million, we're just gonna cover it out. The reason this works is because the co-ops have been in business for eight years. They're in business because some of the major electric providers at the time, eight years ago, said, you know what, the ROI is not gonna work. We can't go there. So all these co-ops pop up. Well, eight years later, they're doing pretty good, aren't they? They're successful, they're operating. Their long-term ROI is what makes this successful. They can't, they don't look 18 months down the road. They're looking 15 years down the road. Don't cherry pick, that's another one. Um, you have to commit to the whole community. Don't go where's the, the most dense population. You have to commit and say, we're gonna cover everybody all the time. Um, it started off small. A guy named Kyle from the co-op, his cell phone was the 1-800 number for the first six months. You called Kyle if your service went down. That's just the way it is. There's the million dollar grant path, but I, I came across something very interesting. I went to the uh, National Telecommunication Providers Conference in Tampa in September. And they said that, the, you know, they talked about 5G and the impending rollout. 80% of the cost in the infrastructure of 5G is going to be fiber in the ground. Let me, let me say that again. 5G wireless, 80% of the cost in infrastructure to provide 5G wireless is going to be fiber in the ground. So if you take this chess match and play it out, if my community has fiber to the home and has this fiber network in place in about five years, five, eight years, and I oversize that fiber, do you think I have a chance of leasing it to a Verizon or a Sprint or a T-Mobile who wants to then bring 5G to my community? It's an interesting concept. The agreement was very simple. Uh, don't try to overreach. Don't create too many hoops. Don't set yourself up to fail. If you create a, a mechanism in there for failure, you will. Uh, we went for the lowest speeds possible at a minimum, 25 and 3. You have four kids streaming Netflix right now. Um, the way I measure my success is how many hugs I get in church that Sunday. That's my success measure. Right now we have $49 a month at 25 MP megabytes, uh, $74 a month for 100, $99 a month for 250, and 169 a month for one gigabyte. And it's unlimited data. There is no cap. Get those kids streaming their Netflix. We did have a clawback provision, of course. You know. You want to make sure that the co-op actually does it. We didn't. The co-ops are not fly-by-night operations. You know they're pretty reliable. They've been here for about 80 years. But we wanted to say, look, if something goes horribly wrong, if a hurricane comes through, if you just fail, if this doesn't work. Let's do 2,000 at home for each home. You don't hook up up to 500. I'm happy to say that we're past that. We have today over 600 homes hooked up, and we are flying. As we're sitting here in this room, someone else is getting hooked up. Prince George is rural, and of course the co-op is in the rural area, which makes it perfect. We went to the places where nobody was, and that was the beauty of it. Think about it this way. The electric co-op through the SEC can use state their funds to bring fiber oversized to their substations. So they connect their substations to do a smart grid system for the electric side of the house. Well, then you go to the fiber side of the house, and that entity comes in and does the drops to the homes and businesses. So you're actually paying for the initial backbone, in essence, of last mile between the electric substations using the electric side. The electric company gets their smart grid system, which they want for outage maps, I don't want to sound big brotherish, but controlling temperature in your home, um, you know, all those Wi-Fi, the smart temperature readers, everything that you want. You need electric, you need an internet service to do that. And it's advantageous for them to build out now. This is actually phase one. Um, I'm gonna step down. 
We have now blown past this. We are down Route 10 through Garysville. We are now down to Disputana, and we are now down to Templeton, Heaven, and Carson. So we're past phase one. We're almost done with phase two, and in essence, we're going into a phase three. We expect every home within the Prince George Electric Co-op electric territory to be covered with, have fiber to the home by 2025. They'll be done. And the reason is they want to make sure they're a membership, they're cooperative, it's membership driven. They want to make sure their members have this fiber to the home. Then we can branch out and go on more Dominion poles, cover the rest of the Dominion customers that are in the middle of nowhere that don't have a Comcast per se. We can actually go on electric, other electric co-op poles. We could leak into Dinwiddie if we had to. Um, broadband plan. We, of course, there was an annual reporting. There was a sale of PGC. I'll pause for picture taking, but I'm not going to read it. I am going to say something right now. If you're an electric co-op president, and you are not oversizing your fiber between the substations, if you're not stringing it for a smart grid system, and if you're not working with your local locality to do this, to do fiber to the home, you should step down as CEO. You just should. <laughs> um, you're standing on the shoulders of your parents and grandparents who took an electric technology 80 years ago and started stringing it in the middle of nowhere here we are 80 years later doing the exact same thing, and you're saying it's too hard or I don't know the technology, neither did your grandparents. We're lacking gumption and we're lacking conviction. And it took, I, I give great, great props to my board, to the IDA board, to Prince George Electric Co-op for coming together and saying, you know what, we're just going to do this. This is ridiculous. This is some of our community service connection commitments. Of course, the Burrowsville Community Center. The library was an interesting one. Our Burrowsville Library, Dominion Power, Middle of Nowhere, Route 10. Interestingly enough, Verizon said, we're going to pull out. What? We're not going to serve you with internet to your library anymore. Verizon DSF. And so Brian Manning, the director of the FMAX Regional Library, comes to us and says, you got to do something. And so we, this was our first pilot project to make an agreement with Dominion, pay the poll fee, get our fiber down the road, connect the library. Well, as we're connecting that day, Brian turns to me and he goes, oh my gosh, what's this going to cost me? He goes, I'm on E-rate right now. I'm on E-rate. And I go, well, what's E-rate? He goes, I'm, I'm on E-rate. Verizon charging me $1,000 a month for DSL internet to Burrowsville <laughs> Library. I'm looking at him, okay. He goes, so what is, what's the co-op going to charge me? It's $82 a month, unlimited service for startup. Kind of go there. <laughs> um, I don't sell fiber. I'm not a consultant. I really, I just need to get it done. I am going to read this, though. <laughs> Unlike electrification long ago, Local governments are going to have to pay their fair share to implement fiber construction. We realize in our community that federal and state financial resources are not going to solve our broadband issue. There is not enough money in the federal and state coffers. We didn't qualify doing the stipulations, or the incorrect map said that we were already covered, and there's too many bureaucratic hoops made by the model unattainable. We just said, look, no more studies, no more testing, no more consultants. Let's just start rolling it out. There's no reason not to do it. It's the cost of fiber. You need to have a quarterback in your community that's going to stand up and take charge and just do it. Now the biggest issue that I get is when am I going to be hooked up? <laughs> um, that's the number one call I get because they hear from their friends and neighbors of the speed, of the accessibility, of the cost. And they're just like, we need to do this too. And if you think it can't happen in your community, someone got electric to that house a long time ago, and it was one of your grandparents. And it's time to do the same thing eight years later. Um, 
Our MOU is complete. It expired on its own accord. The co-op stretched the ROI, so they're going to keep going and make money. And they're going to keep rolling this out, but it is going to be slow. It's going to take till 2025. But, you know, it, it's, it's a path forward, quite frankly. Um, we have about, and I guess one thing, we, and in case you're wondering, we have about 3,600 connections that we estimate still need to be made. Uh, between now and 2025. So of course, those are ballparks based on our GIS system. And of course, Comcast and Verizon, nobody else shares their maps, so we don't know where they're at either. And with that, I will close my presentation and turn it over for any questions. Thank you. Uh, do you have a question? Yes, sir. I'm not very knowledgeable about this, but I've been deeply interested in this. Is it possible? that either through the state or the federal government, we could access their buying power to provide us with fiber in a bundle, on a roll, the cheapest we can get. We've been told it, uh, it costs $35,000 a mile to put fiber into the ground. And that may be true. But if we had the fiber, and we contracted with the people to carry the fiber up to a point and then hired someone to connect that, would that be something worth doing? Well, I'm gonna give these guys a chance to, to think about that question, and I, I'm gonna talk about my experience. We did have that conversation with the co-op, and because it was a million dollars up front, they, one of their purposes were, they wanted to buy in bulk as much as they could up front for the economies of scale, knowing where they had to go, they all parked that linear mile, and they said, okay, well, if we do it this, it's this price per foot, and it's better if we buy it all up front in bulk, get it ordered, and then we'll slowly get it built out, constructed over time. So you, you do get some savings there, the, but when, when somebody quotes you, I mean, it's worth noting that anytime somebody quotes you an average figure like that, different miles, no same mile, right? So, you know, a mile over a ridge line is very different from a mile across a, a flat place that already has poles. That's also your all-in cost. And so, when we talk about the cost, it's not really the, the cable, the fiber optic cabling that's the expense there. It's the truck, it's the crew, it's the make ready and engineering on the poles, and then it's the equipment that you need to have in the cabinets to do your drops and to make sure that that network is lit and routes traffic in the way that it should. Uh, but the, the, so that's all to say, yes, there's some savings to be gained there. They're not as great as you, as, you, as you might hope just out of the gate, thinking, all right, well, let's, you know, let's just buy a bunch more of this stuff. The thing that is very true, though, is that economies of scale really start to apply when you start to look at larger projects. One of the things that we've seen, the difference between the kind of grants that come in to the Tobacco Commission and body and we had a few million dollars out, or maybe even just one million dollars out, very different, and our cost per connection has gone down significantly as we started spending more money. Because if you think about it, you've got the engineer, you've done your engineering, you've got the guys out there doing it, you just have them keep going. You know, I mean, the, the, and the, 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 the cost per pass goes down significantly. Uh, another thing to think about, while it is true that, that fiber to the home is the, the, the gold standard, uh, fixed wireless, so that's distinct from your, your phone, it's where there's an antenna on the structure. You can do a very robust signal, that's a new and developing technology. Excuse me, it does not offer speeds as fast as fiber to the home, but it is true that as each technological improvement happens, it, it makes faster gains than they're making on the fiber side. For some very dispersed populations where the terrain lends itself, fixed wireless is an excellent solution that'll get folks online quickly. Um, and we'll give, you know, we can get better than that 25.3. We've got wireless uh, providers now offering 100 and 100 symmetrical. That's probably the, the practical limit for that technology right now, obviously. Fiber can go up to a, a gigabit, but um, most, most non-business users don't need that, that much data. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I would encourage people to, for many rural communities, a hybrid solution is gonna be the best solution, um, particularly for those of y'all that are not sitting in uh, cooperative footprint, um, either in part or in whole. Uh, those are huge uh, uh, leverage points for those who have. 
I may, uh, Brent Torres, Walsh County, uh, just speaking to the stipulations, the incorrect maps, and all of the bureaucratic hoops. Uh, really applaud your efforts to have the federal funds block granted down to the state. I think that would be a fantastic thing. If I'm not mistaken, I don't think that there were any successful applications out of the Commonwealth for the $600 million that was touted as available for Bob Bennett. Not for the grant funds. We got a couple of loans. Right. So very little participation. And a lot of it is because of a lot of the stipulations. We just can't qualify. Um, I would just uh, like to suggest that uh, you know, those stipulations make it difficult all around. The governor has put out the mandate for universal broadband access. Right now, body funds are subject to 90% unserved only. Uh, before we know it, there's not going to be a lot of chunks of the Commonwealth that aren't 90% unserved. And if you have a legacy provider, wireline provider, in your community, then getting to that universal coverage within your community using a body grant is nearly impossible unless uh, DHCD and body allow us to stipulate the specific service areas that we're going to target with fixed wireless solutions. Well, you, you so. are permitted to do that. One of the, you know, it's, it's only the, so the, the, the dig, dig into the weeds there a little bit, guys. The, the rule right now is that we can't use any of these public funds to overbuild existing providers, which makes a certain sense, right? There's been private investment to create those, and we also don't have enough money, so we shouldn't spend it where there's already a provider. We're we'll spending it getting to as many people as possible. It gets very challenging in the wireless space because as often as I tell a radio signal where it has to stop, they're not good listeners. And uh, what we run into is that they keep, you know, a radio signal will keep going and it'll drift into an area that's already served. We are going to refine, kind of get better at this pretty fast. And so we're going to refine the body rules this next uh, year and hopefully allow for a much more detailed uh, rule around angling both vertically and in terms of what percentage of the, the pie around the, the tower counts, um, as well as offer some other opportunities for folks to, to more carefully tailor those. It is true though that you, you know that 90% unserved area, it can, it's it's just in the project area. It doesn't have to be in the uh, in the total community. And so we we're with you. We want to we want to make that doable. And, and as long as DHCD allows the project area to be defined by the applicant as that those areas specifically that will be funded using grant funds, mm -hmm. not the entire radius, then I think we're all okay. But well, otherwise, you, you, you know, in our community, we're talking about six thousand dollars per home to hook up versus six hundred dollars per home to hook up. Right. I can ask for a body grant for sixty over here or seventeen hundred over here. The value proposition is a no-brainer, but with the restrictions that we deal with, we're just not confident that we're going to be successful. It is true right now that DHCD will permit you to do that. The it's good to hear it. Really <coughs> Comcast is coming out very strongly saying that we can. Uh, well, they have their view, and, and uh, you all have yours, and, and the, the, the regulators will, you know, the, the, the body team will, will make a call. Thank you. <coughs> I think there's one that a state corporation which I may have for doing everything the and APCO. Can you repeat the question for us, please? Uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, are the investor-owned utilities, Dominion and Appalachian Power, similarly postured to the, the electric co-ops, and then also is the state corporation commission? Uh, on board. Uh, the Dominion and APCO question, yes, so both Dominion and Appalachian Power were the ones that were that had their regulation changed in that legislation. The, the co-ops were already permitted to do it. The trick was getting, you know, they don't have most of the customers in Virginia, Dominion and APCO do it, so we had to get them into a place where they could be helpful. State Corporation Commission, we're going to find out how on board they are, because they're going to make it, they're going to have this hearing, they're going to make a ruling in January, and that's why I think we need to persuade them to be on board, and that's where that public comment comes. And, and, and another thing, I, I was just going to say that uh, the fiber is also, the, these fiber uh, uh, conduits are getting smaller. You get 438 in a conduit right now, and, you know, uh, so it's getting smaller and it's, uh, that's, you know, economically that's probably the best way to go with fiber right now is to get, the more you can get in your conduit while you're putting it up, uh, is you're better off. And, and it's, just as you know, just as cheap. Yeah. You know, I mean, that much more forward. Nobody, 20 years from now, is going to regret extra fiber yeah. or a better tower. I mean, it just you, these are these assets. At least for the life of the assets, are going to be.
valuable, and I think for many, many years later. And from a local perspective, there was a process to go through with the SEC to create a subsidiary. It wasn't onerous. It, it took a little time, but it, it didn't stop us. It didn't delay us. This is really addressed to the uh, the Kill Book. We've already addressed this with Evan in the past. Uh, rural counties, I'm, I'm Lunenburg County. Okay. Uh, right now, we've got about 12,000 people. We're losing about 100 people every year, and that's going to accelerate. The, the plan that the, the governor has is to have all of the rural counties uh, hooked up in 10 years. By that time, it will be down to about 11,000 people. All of our industry left with NAFTA. All of our people are leaving now. By the time we get hooked up, Lunenburg County is going to be the world's largest retirement community. We need this yesterday. Uh, 10 years from now is way too many places. That's like saying to rural counties, in 10 years, you can start getting competitive. We need to be competitive right now. So anything that, that you folks in Richmond can do to help us out, that's what we need you to do. I think you'll find that most of the rural legislators are going to be supportive of the governors. Whatever whatever that figure uh, ends up being, I think we're going to be supportive. And I just saw Senator Ruff come in. I'm sure he's going to give us a big thumbs up on that too. But uh, we're all, uh, you know, we really uh, share in the governor's uh, uh, tenure. Uh, less than, we want it less than 10 years. We're like you all. We want it in five years. You know, if we get there, we, we won it last week. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we would like to get it done. So I think most of the rural legislators, senators, and delegates are going to be supportive by the governors. Whatever the you know, whatever that figure the governor thinks the budget can stand, we'll be supportive of that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say again, this Senate struck, and so yeah. it, it's it, the, the our political will is measured not. <laughs> yes, I just like to agree with the. Uh, gentleman from uh, Lunenburg. Uh, in my county, Halifax County, uh, we actually have a uh, mixture of both um, electric co-op and Dominion. The problem that we're finding in uh, having dialogue with the electric co-op is that they are pro fiber to the home. Dominion is pro to its substations, which does not provide fiber to the home. They have not committed, to my understanding, fiber to the home and the majority of the county is Dominion. Um, how do we uh, get over those hurdles? Well, so the, the, the legislation that was passed for Dominion and APCO actually forbids them from doing the, the service provision to the home. They can be a middle mile provider. So what we need is either the co-op or another entity <coughs> to make use of that Dominion fiber that will run It'll be kind of a middle mile, right? So it'll run between and among their substations. Right. And then somebody can hop on that network and expand it out, whether it's fiber to the home or whether you're citing towers on it. Um, you know, in Halifax, we've got a couple of things cooking. Uh, you've got Mecklenburg Electric Co-op doing work. You've, you've got some service in the towns. Uh, and then there's a, there's a wireless project we're about halfway through uh, that's going to cover a, a good amount of Halifax. And I think there's another phase that's going to sit, if I recall correctly, I, I apologize, there's a lot of grants that have gone across my desk, but it might my memory is that we were doing phases one through three of five have been funded so far, so there exists an opportunity to continue to expand that wireless service. Uh, that's all challenging. Uh, another thing that is tough, though, is you know we make a three-year grant through the Tobacco Commission, which is what's funding that that wireless service. What happens is we have our meeting, we get we fund it before my staff's even written up the paperwork to get to the county for y'all to sign it. The newspapers already said, "Don't worry, Halifax." You're getting internet right. coverage, and so people start start to say, "Well, all right, I, I read about this last week. Where's my where's, where's my right. service?" And it's a you know it's still a three year project, and so right. uh, I know that, that that's the challenge is that these things just take a while to build. If we got started yesterday, it still would be a while because it's just the physical constraints of building this infrastructure out take time. Um, I will tell you, the more money Virginia puts on the street between local governments and state governments the more energy and attention will come in from the telecom industry nationally. When I talk to the big players, and you know, and they're, they're on both sides of this question, frankly, but when I talk to the Comcasts and the Verizons uh, and Cox and Chantel, and say, what would it take, you know, there's a certain amount they're gonna spend across the whole country every year expanding their networks. And the question is, well, how do we get more of that into Virginia? How do we get y'all expanding your network too? The answer is, 
show us commensurate efforts, show us the Commonwealth making moves, show us the local governments making moves. Same deal with, with the wireless providers and the new startups. If, if we're going to get new capital in and the private sector is going to come meet us, we've got to show them that we're invested too. When a county like, like Prince George said, we're going we're to take on a million dollar bond to get this thing up rolling, that's a very strong signal that that's a community that takes it seriously and is going to get it done. And by the way, they're getting it done. Right. Well, one of the things that we have, Evan, and, and, and I do follow you, is that with the wireless, uh, there are five phases. Uh, we've been at that about two years, of which phase one has not even been completed. Uh, the other thing that I hear with the co-op is that we have to work through hopeful paperwork that they said the SEC, uh, they're hopeful that they would provide for the waivers because there's actually rulings as far as electric co-ops and and, and dominions not to interfere outside of zone. Yes. So where are we as far as getting those waivers to, because it's to my understanding the electric court is actually uh, definitely and indeed um, very much interested in well, providing I, it throughout the county. Point you again to, to weigh in with the FCC and, and share with them your view that they should be as supportive of broadband expansion activities as they can be. Um, there's going to be a lot of questions before them. They're, they're, in the next three years, they're going to have dozens and dozens of these projects. And if they hear just from the folks who stand to benefit that day and in that project, in one of, in each of those projects, they're not going to they're not going to get a sense of how important this is to everybody. I think we all need to look out for everybody else, and that's why I'm asking folks to weigh in on this Grayson project. It's the first one. Uh, that'll be that's going to wind up being pretty darn important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Brothers here, and I appreciate you guys and the uh, and what you're doing. Uh, I own a broadband company, and I'm building in four rural areas in Southwest Virginia, and I've experienced, uh, uh, you know, the troubles of everybody calling your phone, wanting it up into the collar. Uh, one of the things I think needs to be addressed, and I think you might have spoke on this a little bit, and I'd like to talk to you later about it, is. Uh, uh, you know, if you have to attach to 50 calls to get 10 homes, uh, that expense, mine since 2004 when I first started my company and built my network to now has more than quadrupled in being attached to the, the power poles. And, you know, when you have to be attached to 50 calls to get to 10 homes, after, either if you do it from my dollar or grant dollar, after the fact, you still got to be able to maintain it. You still got to be able to survive and be able to keep it. And, and really the ratio of that too to the economics is this. Uh, you might have, you might hook up 20 customers and only 10 pay you. So it's, it's all about the economics of it. And I, I'm very grateful for what you all are doing. And some of the conversation I heard from your county and what you're doing is something that has, you know, actually inspired me to look at something maybe a little bit different uh, in regards to that. Terry and Evan, I'm, I'm grateful of what you guys are doing as far as putting that strategic plan together and helping us to get it out there. I just think some of those things need to be addressed because, you know, after it's all said and done, you spend the money on the project, you got to be able to maintain and, and stay in business. You know, and it's tough when you have to attach to, in rural, I'm doing a project in Dickinson County right now, and uh, I'm, I've committed to go up the holler in the valley to those people that are in desperate need. Uh, because I feel like there's a there's such a need for it, and and there's a, and a start, you know, and the kids in public education and stuff have to have this, and people that work from home. So uh, I'm committed as a, an owner, and I'm a small guy uh, to build it out. But I think that's something that definitely needs to be addressed as far as <coughs> there's a way that can put in place over a period of years, a five or three years, or whatever that can help. Uh, so we can become sustainable with the amount of numbers that we can eventually get hooked up. But I appreciate what you're doing, and I just want to say that. Thank you. I'm Tommy Walter from Nelson County. I hear a lot of this comments and stuff that's been made and the presentation in here. I think we went a little way ahead of that. In fact, we started our channel 12 years ago. We had a board member who was a tech person at the high school that really pushed us and pushed us to get our plan together and have it ready. We got it ready, we put it on the shelf, and when some of this big money come out way back there, we were one of two people that got the big money. 
and we were able to run 26 miles of backbone from one end of the county to the other end. In fact, you have to be ready to let your co-op with the shovel. Then we have put together the authority, which our board is the same board as that, and did certain projects in high end of the county. We had went out, the county said, okay, we will put up $1,500 per connection to assist you, and we will let you pay it back over a five year period uh, interest free. So that worked great for those who wanted to walk close. Well, over behind my business, there was Nanny Connection back then. And some of them were right on the road, some of them way back off the road. So what we did is put together a plan where they went together as a community. And then we put $1,500 times how many connections there were. So that has been great, plus they had to pay a little bit more. But right now, the co-op, the stock of Central Virginia Electric, we trained them. See, uh, he was on our board for eight years. And then we also went to the Central Virginia and then sent to the top hand. Most brilliant person I've ever met. He is the one that came to our county. And the only thing that kept us stuck in first was your tobacco money went to mathematics. They did that one first, but we were second. <laughs> and what they do, they come into a subsection. And in my area, it's the biggest one, and there's like seven fingers of it. And they have just about to complete that whole thing. They will finish our whole county with their customers within the next year or so. It was like a two-year project. They will come back within that five year and try to make an attempt to have everyone in that whole county connect. Uh, yes, it's good for them. It, it's been great for us. We as a county, in fact, it may even happen Thursday, we've got a system that we own um, that uh, is underground, or they don't have anything over here, but uh, we will be transferring our whole system worth three or four million dollars to the co-op. We don't want to be in the fiber business. We want them to be in a power business and you know they are using ours, they're using theirs, and I mean it's 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 so life changing. You know, back kids when they reach uh, middle school, we give them a tablet to use until they are senior. And the ones that don't have it, they've got to go to the library, they gotta sit inside McDonald's, or they got to go this place or that to use them. I mean, it's, I mean, to hear the people that we have worked so hard with, and I work very hard in my area, we end up over five years here, we got 450 some connections. But the co op is already coming in now and up in the thousands of connections already. Uh, that is the most, I and mean, that's the best thing in the world that ever happened to us. But if you don't think it's life changing, when somebody can sit at home and do their work from home and not have to drive to work, uh, the families, I mean, it, it's just tremendous. I think we were ahead of the ball game, but uh, if it starts off, it, you've got to have somebody that's interested. And uh, to me, it's a no-brainer for the county. I mean, it, this co-op, the what they plan on doing, they're doing all the customers that they have, which they claim that they will have approximately 35,000 customers hooked up when they get through <coughs> over that five year period. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just so unreal. But, uh, but you've got to really look ahead. You think you can't afford it. Uh, we spent, we got a grant, I think it was three million dollars or something, but then we put up the money that sells, the county did. We would put up like a hundred thousand a year, and now that we're gonna give that system away, we're gonna keep that authority. You know, there's about three or four hundred thousand dollars in that account now, plus that loan stuff I was talking about over the next three or four years, we we'll pay back another three hundred. So we'll help to take that money and help make any of the connections that we can make. And the 
ADP has been a pain, but I'm just sitting in a meeting with Gary and the guy from AEP. They are making some improvements in our county, and they've agreed now to make those improvements where we need it the most as far as fiber. And they will, so they're really cooperative. And then I got a little tiny piece up in the end of my district that's to me. Nobody said anything for 10 yet for that. We've been very blessed. Thank you for your comment, sir. Uh, Bob Martin from Carroll County, and uh, I'm trying to think, I think it was uh, early 2018, uh, the White House had a conference, and it was uh, prosperity <coughs> in rural America. And they had 49 states there, and I was one of 200 people representing rural America from Virginia. And uh, Sonny Perdue, was, the Secretary of Agriculture, was the chairman of that. And they identified what was handicaps for uh, prosperity in rural America. And the, the number one thing that was echoed and reinforced was the need for high-speed internet broadband uh, for rural America. And the point was made that in 2050, uh, the population of the United States will be 400 million. And that don't phase you, but that's 31 years from now, okay? And the, the food produced will not be grown in New York City. So that narrows it down a little bit. It'll be in rural America. And the, the big things were for us to produce the food to them, we have to have uh, high performing educational research. But the number one thing that was drilled in was we have to have broadband, a high speed internet. And uh, the, the president had already uh, ordered a uh, committee to start working on broadband. And it was just getting rolling. Uh, later, later, uh, half, Virginia was split in half, half the supervisors at a time went to a White House conference, and it was uh, primarily to hear about uh, problems or needs in the counties. And uh, Carroll County, and I remember Loudoun County was there, and the, the big thing was, we need broadband, high-speed internet. And that has really been a problem for us, along with some other folks, about keeping the industry. Our population is, is dropping also. And uh, the, uh, so, so I think the federal government is pushing. I'd be surprised if there's not more money coming. But, uh, uh, and by the way, going to Grayson County, that line comes up through Carroll County, Poplar Camp, Wiss County, Jackson's Prairie. And I think it goes over into Bland, maybe. Uh, uh, but, uh, and it comes, the funny thing, it comes right through my little five acres of bottom land. And, uh, and the only thing we get at 12 o'clock there is the sun shines at 12 o'clock because it's too loud. And, uh, and we don't have coal, but we need to be able to hook on the same as Grayson County's pushing. And, it's coming. And, sure. and, yeah, stay after stay AP. After. Uh, it, it'd be a tremendous benefit, and if anybody can do it, Cheap. They are the, the well, they, they, they've been great partners. I, yeah. I think Appalachian Power deserves a lot of credit. They, they, they're they taking this on. They understand that their future is, yeah. is tied up in the future of their communities. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Martin. Yeah. We have about two more minutes for actual questions. Anyone? Yeah, I have a question. Um, how much is the, like, I mean, we're talking about the broadband, um, the actual real carriers that have been, I mean, coming to the subdivisions like the Comcast and Verizon's, 
I mean, I'm hearing a lot of new companies and so forth that are coming to do that, but you do have, I mean, they came into Caroline 10 years ago, the Comcast, they came into all the subdivisions, they got all their money, and you, uh, you had mentioned something where the carrier said, well, you, well, we went to them, we went to Comcast, we said, we, we have some money, we have an idea. We'll do a one-third, one, one-third, one-third. Well, we'll, we'll pay for one-third of the, of the 50000 per mile they were quoting. You know, have the customers pay the one-third, and then you guys put up the one-third. That was in September. That was that meeting was in July of 2018. They have not counted us back. So, I mean, it's a little frustrating on our end, too, when we start talking with the carriers. And I, I appreciate what you guys did, but the carriers that are right in our neighborhoods, I mean, they need to be able to come to the table, too, because they can say that all they want, but that's lip service that they're giving to you. Well, they're doing. I mean, they're they're picking their spots, and so uh, and they always will. Uh, it, it's worth noting that uh, uh, you know they're, they're easy to beat up on, and I don't I don't think they're always good actors. But uh, it is still true that, that Comcast, I believe, has hooked up more people through this program than any other individual provider. Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of folks have gotten service with them. Um, they are not always the easiest partner to deal with. In the same way, even a well-intentioned. Uh, gentleman from the USDA or the FCC is difficult to deal with, overly bureaucratic, and has their own agenda. It's certainly true in all ways of the large telecom providers. Um, what we want to do with you is work with you to develop the partnership that's going to get you across the finish line. And so that means if Comcast doesn't return your calls, it's time to find a new ISP. And it's fine that Comcast is where Comcast is, but there's a lot of folks that aren't in their footprint. Let's figure out how to get them served in your community, whether it's on your own or in partnership with your neighbors. And we can we can support you in that. One more question. Sure. Uh, so VDOT's got a couple of things going on. One is uh, their day one's policy on their road right away is actually pretty darn good, but it could be better and it could be simpler and we need to offer, uh, we shouldn't have to do these piecemeal permits where somebody's got to re-permit it every 70 miles. You ought to be able to go in, get a single project permit, and just have that be the end of your interaction with VDOT regulators. We had a second problem with bridges. We're smoothing that out, but it used to be you could go along the roadway just fine. As soon as you get a bridge or an overpass, everything comes to a screeching halt. Yeah, the VDOT will tell you you had to bore under the other road or all sorts of other stuff instead of just tack it on. I, I'm not a bridge engineer, I'll say that right up front. I also think it's very unlikely that uh, 20 pounds of conduit across the bridge is going to only do its collapse. Uh, it's going to find a way to do that safely. And in fact, VDOT's been pretty good working with us on that. Um, and then VDOT also owns a whole bunch of, of powered vertical assets in those rights of way. If we can use wireless projects, we just need to make sure that we've got a good inventory of that. They didn't really know where all those were. I mean, nobody would asked that question before. Hey, where's every sign? And wrote and wrote uh, that we've got power. And so they're, they're in the process of figuring that out now. It's been a bigger challenge than you would have thought. Because if you haven't been keeping track of it in that category, you got to go figure it out, right? And so uh, we're doing all that with VDOT. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I have a, have a lot of respect for them. They've got a hard job with multifaceted. This is new, right? They didn't used to be about telecom. So they've had to pick it up. Um, that's a big animal with a lot of different departments, but we're working pretty well. And with that, thank you very much. That's lunch.